warned him about the title of his speech. His title? If you like my work on the lens, then you're going to love my <laughs> Uh, of, the, of the 
I ride, I try to ride the PSA buses whenever I can. One of the coolest things I've ever seen in my whole life is when my wife and I were vacationing in New York City. And through my uh, career, I have met tons of New York City transit uh, former employees. And what is, it, they have 65,000 people that work for the New York City Transit Authority. And so there is an incredible disconnect for two countries, the bus people and the rail people. And I walk out of this hotel in New York, and there are these two bus supervisors standing out there, and it was wintertime, and they had jackets that said NYCT buses, and they had huge letters, and of course they had top of them, and then they, they loved buses. They were so proud not to be part of the rail industry. <laughs> so I immediately went back to Des Moines, Iowa, and I got all my supervisors to change their coats that says Des Moines buses, as if we had a rail somewhere in some other part of Iowa. <laughs> So while I have no problem calling myself a bus guy, the reason I think it's so important that the Screenlight Canals plan also include a future rail component in it is because I believe rail is a necessary mass transit option that can help our community, help our community best. It can regenerate our built-out land use with transit-oriented development. Since the rail line opened in Charlotte, they've seen $1.4 billion in new or planned private development outside of their downtown in a quarter which saw no development in a and neighborhood decline since the textile and industrial activities left a decade before. It can help grow our population, have young people consider moving here because there are new jobs here. That's probably the greatest lesson I got from Charlotte. The people that are riding their transit system, rail and the end bus system in Charlotte, most of them didn't vote for it in 1988 because they didn't live there. The people that vote for it still live where they live, out in the suburbs, car garages, and they still drive their car, just like they did. It's their kids. It's their kids that are that are riding it now. And instead of moving to New York City or D.C., after they go to UNC and Chapel Hill, they move back. Not one percent of North Carolina ever goes to Duke, because only people from New Jersey go to Duke. They all go to UNC, and they go back. They come back to Charlotte, and they live along the transit lines. They choose to do that. Now we drive down the Charlotte Rail Corridor, and at stage after stage, and there's apartment complexes being built, one after the other. Some 4,000 units were built there just last year alone along that line. Those kids from Charlotte are moving into so they can tra take transit into the city for their jobs, to watch the Charlotte Bobcats lose, whatever. <laughs> Buses will always carry a majority of the riders, and I know, under this initiative, for the first time here in Pinellas County, Buses will be the choice of travel for people that have cars who live here. But I know that doesn't really happen today very much. But to transform our community, I think for the better, we need to have a plan that has rail included as well. Another thing I do love is Tampa. Our plans must be designed to work in a regional context for the whole Tampa Bay area. I still think the SDA and Pinellas County are pretty darn regional with 24 municipalities, but my friend, I hope, Senator Latvala, doesn't necessarily think that's enough. He is right. A transit system that works for the entire Tampa Bay while still being responsive to customers would be better than what we have now. Our green light plans for both the buses and the rail have been designed to be very successful in Pinellas. But obviously they would work better <coughs> with connections to West Shore and Tampa. I'm, I'm proud of uh, Chair Danner and the PSDA board and the various county commissioners like Dana Long. Um, for seeing the benefits of a regional mass transit solution, maybe a little bit more than our friends over in Hillsborough. What I'm even happier is those discussions that happened last year have now birthed a new smart card system, a Tampa Bay wide uh, smart card fare system, so that you could use uh, that on any transit system someday from Lakeland all the way down to Sarasota. Um, I'm thankful for Tampa for another reason. Without learning from the lessons of failed 2010 referendum, we would be much worse off. We have a completed plan. We're getting rid of our property tax, uh, so that most Pinellas property owners, the 1% sales tax will actually cost them less than what they're paying for a much uh, less transit system that they have today. We're starting much earlier. They started five months in advance. We're 15 months out from this vote with an outreach campaign that will hopefully get us an opportunity to get to the grassroots in a way the Hillsborough campaign just didn't have time to do. But probably just as important for learning the lessons from Hillsborough is learning the lessons from Charlotte, from Denver, from St. Louis, even little Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which just passed the sales tax. 
investment would not just benefit those who rode it, but would benefit the entire community. Those city investments in transit are, are benefiting their communities. They are. <laughs> the new private development along the line in Charlotte has created $12 million a year in new property tax that is helping fund the police, the fire, the schools, the parks in Charlotte, benefiting that community. Whole state and analysis even far as far back as a week after the failed Hillsborough referendum so showed strong support for moving this conversation of how transit and transportation investments can help our community move forward. Tampa Bay Times, Bay News 9, uh, poll this past December showed 60% of NLS residents were willing to spend tax dollars on rail. This is the Pinellas way. I am learning that. We do look beyond ourselves to what can help our community. We make decisions by consensus. By design, this whole green light plan is being done by consensus as a dialogue with many political, business, and civic leaders engaged rather than one dominant leader. Believe me, I know it's going to be very hard. I feel like we're already behind, but I really, I really do enjoy talking to people about buses and trains and my favorite movie. Because the ballot initiative is more about helping our community than it is to track the track age or bus manufacturers, I do appreciate this is a political issue, and that's why I am so happy to introduce my board chair. Uh, and he is really a true transportation technical expert in his own right, uh, but he's also one of the most skilled consensus building leaders I've met. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Jen Cameron. One of the good things I really do also like to talk a lot about transportation. I'm, I'm glad to be here to do this today. And the best part of it, though, is for the next 45 minutes, we're not going to talk about it either. <laughs> <laughs> now, several years ago, when I was on the PSTA board, and I, I am chair of the PSTA board, I'm vice chair of the MPO, and I represented both Mayor Foster and Mayor Baker on Sparta, part the seven county transportation board that represents seven counties, six transit agencies five regional planning councils, two DOT districts, and about 57 cities. So it's a very large area to cover, but it really gives us that regional perspective of how far behind our, not, our, not only our community, but this area is on transportation investment. Several years ago, DOT came to the PSCA board and pointed out that probably our peninsula had constrained on our growth, and 94% of the land that, that is buildable is already built on. They could improve our lane miles in, count, in the county by about 25% over the next 40 years or so. But I also pointed out that our vehicle miles that we travel are increasing at three times that amount. And if you put those numbers together, there's a point where they convert where you have gridlock. Uh, we've got a pretty good system here in St. Petersburg. We can get around, we've got a grid system, but all of you know the minute you leave, you get on the Howard Franklin Bridge or US 19, you're stopped. So we had to do something different. We had to provide options for people. Um, and then transportation is expensive. This is an expensive project. But if you look at the numbers right now, we are spending $46 million a mile on US-19. We have done so for the last 10 years. And if you think about what that means when US-19 is finished, and I don't know what that means to be finished. There's another little pass coming after this one and after that one. But then you have to ask yourself, what's, what's next when US-19 is congested? start building Belcher Road to look like US-19, or Homerton Road, we should be double that. We, we can't pave our way out of this with our road system. We really have to give people options. Um, our area office on aging did a survey of um, not, not, not all of them, 45, 55, and 65 year olds about transportation. And when asked, when you can no longer drive, what will you do? And the answer that 96% of those groups said was, I don't know. Um, or the second answer was get a bicycle, which is even scarier. <laughs> <laughs> but we do. We, we, we've got some really great things going on. Um, I applaud Brad board to move forward. Um, it's a challenging board. We, we have 15 members, and I've been on it for eight years now, and I think probably the only unanimous vote we've ever had is to move forward on this project and ask the county commission to go to referendum in 2014. Um, the county commission then in the near event unanimous vote agreed to do that as well. Um, I think there is a big difference in, in our county and, and Hillsborough and other counties. Um, but like Brad said, with 24 cities, we've really got to build a consensus. Um, people in Dundee have a fantastic city and they know they are the center of the universe. And all the rest of us are suburbs of Dundee. And that's a good attitude for them to have. We have to keep that in mind when we go and talk to them about the transit system there. So there, there is uh, 
opportunity here. We are way out ahead of it. I think this green light is a way to get involved early, find out what it is. We've got a basic framework of a plan. We're going to listen to the input. We're going to hear from you as to how we can move it around a little bit, where we need more buses, less buses, things like that. Um, and certainly what we hope is that at the end of this year, as this plan is complete, there won't be anybody that can say, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't hear it. Uh, we've, been, we've been going around for, for months. Uh, first, the alternative analysis, which was the rail component. That was about an 18 month study that, that looked at every single option of commuter rail, and bus rapid transit, light rail, where the alignment should be, how many stops there should be. How do you get over to Hillsborough? It, it's very important. Our Franklin Bridge is 15 years old. Um, we've asked the DOT to move the study on the new bridge up to coincide with this effort. And looking at it right now, how do you expand that bridge? How do you include transit component on it to get to the airport, to get to the West Shore the World Center. Um, when, you, when you talk about jobs and growth, if you combine the Gateway and West Shore areas on each side of Al Franklin, you have the largest employment center south of Atlanta. That's huge for us. That'll help our future, our growth, getting people here, getting jobs. But they're disconnected by that. Al Franklin is a parking lot during rush hour today. So that's another piece that's very important. Uh, some of the smaller things we're doing, the, the Central Avenue trolley, fastest growing around in the city. With this, instead of just having blue diesel buses with a number, changing the mindset a little bit, making them look like trolley, calling it the Central Avenue trolley, running it on 15 minute headway so you don't have to know the schedule. The worst thing that can happen is you have to sit with the longer your restaurant until the next one comes. And the ridership's increased 40% since that's been running a little over a year now. So people do want options. They do want to transit. We have the network in place that will make it work. And we're really looking forward to hearing from everyone and going on this exercise both this year to finish the plan and then next year it will be handed off to the private sector to do a full 11 month campaign if we've got enough time to really inform everyone and listen and work on that. So again, I thank you for the opportunity.